So it's no secret, I'm a poet, uh, poetry, it's no methodology, just results. And I didn't practice any of this, uh, so we got nothing prepared, prepared for nothing. Uh, just kidding, I've got like seven or eight poems to read, and I think that it's going to be fun. And I'm really happy that I have a printout, because to rereading it, looking at this, for me, I don't know, it would suck. I'll wait till everybody gets up. Um, so the first poem I'm gonna re uh, I'm gonna read is called Ode to Doorknobs. I did like a Pablo Neruda. He did like a whole book of uh, Odas Elementales. You know, he does like uh, Ode to Onions, Ode to Soup, Ode to a ton of random stuff. And so, but I wanted to do stuff like that, but with uh, like I called them like industrial odes, right? So I did like Ode to Doorknobs. Oh, the credit cards, microwaves. I spent a lot of time thinking about microwaves. I don't know why. Um, oh, wow. Whatever size you want. All right, cool. So, first one is uh, Oh, the doorknobs. Crack and rattle go crowds of concrete jungles jostling open with the force of curled copper and brass, mummies of controlled embers whose utility of negative hand shapes is discovered in an ice age contained in a room. You are a wrist daydream, a woman who worries she'll never be touched again like a love letter tied around a pigeon's ankle. You protect samples of secret cures by refusing to budge. Ocean boulder, tiny sun trapped in the light it pours over our heads like pots of burning oil on the sidewalk at the drain's request. Forget your past of melted metal. Forget the smeared sweat, the scent of private parts. The rattlesnake of loose screws lives in your lean wood curling into itself for a craving of its own tail, yanked by yearning for the cleaning cleave of wind as you, alloyed security guard, let yourself become a negative space for fear of losing the privilege that makes you the envy of the walls. Yeah. Um, okay. Thanks. Okay, so this next poem is called Why I Shave My Beard. So I used to have a beard, right, for like three, four years. It looked like Brian. My sister called me Drake. Um, I guess I kind of look like him. Without it, I apparently I look like Daddy Yankee. Um, but anyway, I was thinking about, like, you know how beards are really popular now? Everyone's got them and everyone looks really cool with them, like all of you guys. <laughs> you know? I just, I don't know. Like, after I shaved it, I tried to grow back and it got really scratchy. And then I was thinking about that while sitting at a cafe. And uh, I wrote this poem. <laughs> it's because it's fun. It makes me laugh because you know some of you guys have asked me like what my day to day life was like, and really um, I was a full time poet, and so you can imagine like if you're following follow me on Snapchat, you know like I watched a lot of Family Guy, and uh, I walked around like taking pictures of street art a lot. Um, actually, that doesn't have to do with this poem though, so I'll just read it. Um, <laughs> why shave my beard? When I learned that all I needed to look smart was a beard, I wanted to look stupid. I wanted to look stupid as a pigeon crossing the street to peck the concrete for worms. I dragged the razor across my bumpy neck like a mop along the floor that hadn't been swept. And when I thought that all it took to be handsome was hair, I shaved my entire head. I shaved my entire head and found a blowhole. Then I poked my brain with two fingers how a teenager swipes a frosting flower off the closest curve of a cake's ringed garden. Tracing the grooves of my gray matter, I came across something that didn't belong, and I was more nervous than a spoonful of instant coffee as boiling water belly flops to burn it, as if an entire lake leapt from the bay into my mouth. I tried to pull it out like a plug deep behind the TV, but I felt something unstick, something rip, and in my palm appeared a taut tangle of unfilled balloons. Okay, man, this is the most Chilean of the things that I did, and uh... I wrote, so Bank the Uno de Mayo, right? Uh, I mean, I have a little epigraph say, this day commemorates the Chilean Navy for a battle they lost against Peru. The uh, president addresses the country from the Congressional Building of Valparaiso inciting protests. And uh, I don't know if you guys know, on that day, um, some of you have been to my apartment, like I was having a salo on my roof, and uh, they burned an entire apartment. And this, uh, like, with these protests, and there was a guy that was trapped in there, unfortunately, and died. And then, um, like, it was burning for, like, six or seven hours this apartment and um underneath it there was a pharmacy that uh closed down and i mean for days like you could smell it all throughout like so it was really uh really
really powerful to be walking around that. And then uh, also that same day, which I mentioned in the poem, they killed uh, two lions at the zoo in Santiago. If you guys hear about that, like, well, like, the way I'm saying it in the poem is not surreal or anything. It's exactly what happened. Um, well, in a poem, as much real as a poem can be. Anyway, thank you the Mayo. They scorched an apartment in Valparaiso. Protesters, picket signs, spray paint, white lines crossed by green policemen with steel shields, nightsticks, and helmets pushing through livid mobs like a tsunami bursting through a skyscraper's windows. Smoke monuments erected from charred Chilean flags spooling from melted driftwood. One body everyone waited to see leap to the asphalt from a fire window. They scorched an apartment in Valparaiso. Meanwhile, from a wooden podium with a small microphone she had to adjust, the president unleashed the budget like a water balloon 20 stories onto a stranger's head. Meanwhile, at the Santiago Zoo, a naked man with a suicide note in his discarded clothes juked security to enter the lion cage. And because they had no tranquilizers, they shot two lions he provoked to save him from being mauled to death. They scorched an apartment in Valparaiso, closing the pharmacy below museum of Tylenol, birth control, hairspray, jugs of protein burned behind now boarded windows, pharmacists and security guards walking to the library for free Wi-Fi to check job listings in Viña del Mar. They scorched an apartment in Valparaiso. Still you can smell the embers as you walk to the Italian cathedral full of angel statues, the graffiti gray supermarket up Cerro Bellavita to Neruda's house, now a museum, and past the trees on the other end of Plaza Victoria. They scorched an apartment in Valparaiso. It reeks of paper money shrieking from the inside of a searing ATM. Okay, so this is like a big uh, emotional turn from that kind of heavy-handed poem. Uh, so the story of this poem is that, uh, you guys know I have a lot of energy and I tend to like knock out at like 10 p.m., right? Not if I drink Cuban coffee at 9 p.m. And so I woke up at 1 a.m. and I was uh, watching a movie, like streaming it illegally, whatever. And uh, you know how when you do that, there's clickbait, like all these articles. But one of them was called, Men, How to Look Young After You Turn 50. And uh, I, it made me laugh so hard, like I immediately wrote a poem about it. And I had all this energy from the Cuban coffee. So like, I, I mean, I was, I don't know. I had a really fun time writing this poem, to be honest. All right. Men, How to Look Young After You Turn 50. Sharpie all of your hairs black. Grow them as long as possible. Meditate 10 minutes a day reciting the mantra, smooth skin, smooth skin. Coat your bathtub in lotion. Use baby shampoo. Practice standing up from your chair without using your throat. Go for morning walks, exfoliate. That means scrub your face so viciously your dead skin falls into the drain like a pet fish. Sport a leather jacket and police officer sunglasses at the mall. Kiss your wife in public, slipping a hand into her back pocket. Make people uncomfortable. Flex your biceps so they pop out of your too tight v-neck like a lollipop in a candy bowl. To avoid wrinkled brows, watch TV instead of reading. To avoid a sagging T-zone, smile every other week only and laugh on either your birthday or Christmas. It's better to be angry because your face will exercise more muscles, keeping its tightness intact. Don't believe the hype about cucumbers. The trend now is pickles. Eight hours of sleep is too many. There's nothing beautiful about losing a third of your life when you're trying to eliminate a third of your life. Abide by these rules, and in no time at all, you will be good as new. Um, there's not really anybody here over 50, I don't think. Yeah. Uh, don't lie. Don't <laughs> 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 <I> use cucumber. <laughs> Trend now is pickles. Trend now is pickles, so. <laughs> I have to change it up. Um, so, like this poem, this next one's called Tchaikovsky, after the uh, composer, really good piano conciertos and all that stuff. And uh, sometimes in the morning, uh, the myth is that I only listen to rap music, but the reality is that I wake up and I put on Tchaikovsky a lot and like other types of music. And uh, I was just really excited one morning and I was listening to him, and so I wrote a poem about it, about being excited. Um, anyway, all right, Tchaikovsky. I'm sexy to strangers and more angry than tea bags. Barred windows, weighty doors. I appreciate your efforts, the way a graffitied building reminisces about white bird shit and accepts the square tongues of paint rollers. 
but my legs are light as unused cannons, and my mom will soon call to divulge the inner workings of my bucktooth rival, Solitude. My head was full of frozen steam like a stalactite, but my ears, now clean and clear, unlocked the maraca rattle of stolen amulets sitting in a vapid sprite can. Today, the laundromat's earthquake only convinces me further of my immortality, like a zooming hand slicing in and out of a fan's tornado without being panged. I like to imagine the soul is what my heart decides to see when she winks at himself in a building's tinted windows. Oh, burn backs of pondering, wet forehead positioned at the sun like an impatient telescope. You will say I'm a superhero, and my kryptonite is Cuban coffee and a long intestine of imported chorizo. My strength is sprinting so blazingly fast, you don't realize I'm scrawny, like a doctor's office in a strip mall. Spartans, in the roll the credits of their Bildungsromans, uprooted trees by pushing against them all night with their burly backs, their bolder shoulders, calves of Mentos mixed with Diet Coke. But Americans know better, name the dream after themselves, to abolish the omnipotent werewolf, choosing to be tamed for the love of hamburgers and dulce de leche ice cream. Every time I try to evolve into a better person, I feel held back and inadequate, like a car so self-conscious it squeaks down the avenue. And when someone tells me to behave like an adult, I wonder, what do you want me to do? With black dress socks with my sneakers? I'd rather mold myself into someone strong enough to bend glass into a ball without a blowtorch. Because marbles are the daughters of diamonds. Diamonds, which we're told are rare, but can be carved out of most mountains. Mountains, obese, but moved an inch yearly by ants, and sharpened by a wind so authentic we can hear it in a toddler's grocery store shriek, the struck matchbox of impending divorce, the word love played on an old piano by lustful fingers rousing the keys to unleash a choir of captive doves. Um, I didn't write this poem in Chile. I wrote a poem like two years ago in Costa Rica, but I got it published while I was here, and I was really happy because, well, it's not published yet. I got accepted for publication, and it's uh, going to be published in a journal I really like. And I kind of like this poem a lot. And uh, also, I want to talk about that for a second, uh, about the idea of publication, because uh, realistically, poets like generally get like 1% of everything they do published, right? So I've got like 10, 12, 15 publications or something. I've written hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of poems, you know, and uh, I just think like, I don't know, maybe something everyone can learn from that is just like, don't try to publish. <laughs> <laughs> no, but like, you know, I do this because it gives me joy, you know, it makes me feel really, like good, it can be expressive, and just like, I don't know, I just want to say like, find joy in your work, even if you don't get published, you know. Most of these poems weren't published except this one. But uh, I like reading them, and I like you guys. All right, cool. Uh, the art on the back of the map. The mountains where you live have been filled with fruits, pineapples stained by strawberries. And I must save you from the mosquitoes passing through the surrounding jungle. Otherwise, what good would I be as the king of ants in your garden? Forget it. I'm going to peel the sheets of grass off the earth's scalp. I want to measure the dirt's thickness. I'm going to Venice, or Spain, or to your house, to show you the glass jar I made for us in the king-size bed I put inside, and the giant dog that guards it, if you're into it. I know I am because I know what I like, because between the cavemen who didn't understand why their teeth hurt so much, and the world where every house is a historical monument where someone famous grew up, there's the beer bottle about to shatter on our heads if we don't move. There's you and me in a paper airplane made of money we don't have yet. So here's to the rolling bowling ball down your grassy mountain, to the archer and his arrows, the sun and his sun. And here's to the flat moon rolling around the earth like a coin on a table, our rope tied to it, and you on my back, looking at the map like Columbus, so certain there's another side. Yeah, all right, man. This poem took me so long to write, because I don't know if any of you guys have ever uh, felt like uh, you're not good enough to do something, or I don't know, maybe some days you don't love yourself as much as other days, you know? Well, many poets that I really like, uh, there's a guy named Roger Reeves, who's dope, he lives in Chicago, really cool. Frank O'Hara, my all-time favorite poet. If you hang out with me for more than a day, I'll read you like all his poems. Um, oh, P.S., he had a really great line I read the other day. He says, what you don't know will hurt someone else. How cool is that? That's a good line. <laughs> um, and then like this other poet named Ocean Wong, who's really incredible. He published a poem in the, the New Yorker called Someday I'll Love Ocean Wong. 
and I read it, and it's so good, this poem, right? But I was thinking, man, like, what about today, ocean? You know? But it's kind of cool, because when you read it, it's like everyone's ocean blonde. And so hopefully you all can be Daniel Eduardo Ruiz, or like your own way of it, you know? <laughs> but uh, it's kind of an homage to those people that I really like, these like really influential poets to me. So uh, today I love Daniel Eduardo Ruiz, um, after many dope poets that came before me. Today I love Daniel Eduardo Ruiz, a short angel on the basketball court who still can't dunk, having shredded five tentacles in one knee, popped both bubble wrap feet, rolled his ankle like homemade croissants, and displaced his shoulders monolith. Oh Daniel, when I think you'll never write another good line, you wake up at 4 a.m. and zoom into the living room like with the bathroom and grab your computer like with the TV remote, and you type until you crack your until your knuckles crack like crisp pork. Just admit it. You're more sexy than vanilla folder with a red top secret stamp that everyone sees but won't look at. Like on a first date, a tight pimple on the forehead of someone who looked better online. <laughs> Dan Daniel, if you really wish to make the world look like you see it, you must lift it off your stomach like the head of a dead dad. Love loneliness. The world can only handle you in small doses. But to be a prisoner, you must be conscious that you can't move like a rock's liquid heart. You're special, and even more so if you believe that you are powerful like a poodle tugging on a neighbor's jeans. Become a better version of yourself if you desire, but right now you should feel as whole and confident as a dryer with its white mouth open. Daniel, aren't you sick of feeling like your future self is above and not in front of you? You must learn to forgive yourself and blame others. You must accept that your hair, when you let it grow, grows into an afro, up, not down. Take more ownership of the language you use. Everyone wants to be the best in the whole world, but if you omit the word whole, maybe you could be happy with only your part in it. Truth is, whatever you believe to be true is, and it's just as okay to feel as light as an empty wallet as it is to feel as expansive as a dandelion. Daniel, you can't be the only one who spent the first 20 few years of his life not knowing that a rooster is a male chicken or that a pickle is a tortured cucumber. Cut yourself some slack. Ignorance is only a sin if you hide behind it, and if you let the stigma of criticism affect you, you only develop a stigmatism, and you're too handsome to be blurry like a 3D movie. That's why I love you today, because you know you can't not be yourself no matter how much like other people you behave, because you know imitation is not only flattery but a model for learning, because, and it took you too long to know it, there are some things about you that are too lovely not to be given back to the world. chasing you with a knife, you just run. You don't look back and say, uh, what does he say, give it up, I was a track star, Mineola prep. Like, you just go, you know? And kind of, when you're doing it, like the first draft is very much uh, improvised in all respects, you know? And the editing is very much the same, but um, kind of like when you get to the final edits, like you start to think, how can I make, like how can I make this poem full of surprise? So it can be re-readable, and so that like it can make you think about language in a different way. So if I uh, end the line like this and start the next stanza, it's meant to, in a sense, uh, highlight that like the disjunction between what these two things are, you know, for example. Or uh, a general rule for like starting poets is don't end lines on uh, like 
and uh, your lines on nouns, you know? Because it looks kind of weird to end a, at least in my opinion, I think like ending a line on the word I is a little bit uh, technically loose. And like, I want my poem not to be loose. Uh, I want it to be very like tight and, you know? Uh, yeah, just very good. Frank O'Hare also, about that, Frank O'Hare says like, I don't believe in like, learning about all this assonance and stuff and being very conscious about it. He's like, the, the equation he makes is, if you, want, if you buy a pair of jeans, you want them to be tight enough so that everyone will want to sleep with you, you know? And so you want your poems to be just like that, you know? Do you write poems in Spanish? Um, yeah, but... Is English your preferred? Yeah, like... I, I like writing them in English better because it's just like, I'm better at the wordplay in English, you know? In Spanish, I think I can come out with like really crispy images, but, uh, and really sonically, it's, it's beautiful, but uh, the challenge for me to write in English, it just, it just, I don't know. I think, I think we'll have to take more time to talk about this at lunch. Uh, yeah. I think, uh, so thank you once again for being here. Very good.